Jesus and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a, as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Thank you. Good morning, church, and a very happy Sabbath and a very happy Chinese New Year to all of you who celebrate in this festive occasion. Okay, they will play the video first, huh? How do we build a firm foundation? Monteverde has more than 800 species of epiphytes. In Genesis 5.22 it says, Tell me about this idea of uh, fasting. Do you think that God will only love you when you are... We're all in this race of life. The Word of God is also our basic... On my own, I know I wouldn't be able to not watch porn. I know I wouldn't be able to have the mindset I do now. He said, why don't you do for once, not what you want to do, but what God wants you to do. This is just a very short preview of what I'm going to share with you this morning. Um, I know we live in troublesome times. What does the phrase, end of the world, mean to you? Maybe we just go back to history about maybe 19 years ago. Imagine you were at the World Trade Center right there in New York City. And you were working uh, in one of the companies located on the South Tower. It's known as the Twin Towers. And then in 8.46 a.m. on September 11, 2001, the North Tower caught fire. There were commotion, chaos, anxiety, confusion, and total breakdown. And while you were working in your office, you did not know what was happening. And then, uh, several minutes later, as you look through the windows of your office that could oversee the entire New York City, you saw a second plane that was coming in your direction. Is that the end of the world to you? If you fast forward to the Boxing Day on December 26, 2004, you and your family were celebrating Christmas and you had a wonderful time at Banda Aceh, one of the beautiful beaches in Indonesia. And their children and the other families were playing in the waters. And then right then and there, you felt the earth rampant. And then you saw the gigantic humongous waves that would be coming at your, you and your family. And you're trying to run away from that that killing waves. But as you stare at those roaring waves, is that the end of the world to you? A few years down the road, in 2008, if you had invested lots of your financial resources in the stock market, in private estate, and you were trying to leverage to get better financial returns for your retirement, and then the stock market collapsed, uh, banks went bankrupt and your fixed deposits that you thought once were forever secure. You could not recover them at all. And then you lost your job. A few months later, the banks came and repossessed your house. You, your family members, were struggling for a place to stay. Is that the end of the world to you? 
When we fast forward to two weeks ago, if all the places in the world you decided to bring your family to celebrate the festive Chinese New Year, if all the cities could have chosen, you have chosen Wuhan in China. And then you were celebrating uh, the wonderful occasion with your family because Wuhan is a city of rich culture and history. And then you heard about the infectious coronavirus virus that was going around the city. And you thought, well, it's just a cough and cold. And then a few days later, you thought that it was infectious from human to human. As you were planning your way out of the city, they locked down the city and you had a total shutdown experience right then and there. You could not leave the city. So you were stuck in the hotel. The streets were empty. And then one of your children, your son, was feeling feverish. Your wife had some respiratory problem in her breathing difficulties. And you need to go to the hospital. As you walked to the nearest hospital, you saw the queue outside the hospitals were hundreds and hundreds of meters long with makeshift shelter and chairs. You will be standing there in that cold winter waiting to be treated. And then you saw cops were being brought out of the hospital. As you were standing there waiting in line, fearful of the situation, is that the end of the world to you? This morning, I want to bring us back to Matthew 24. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew 24. Um, in Matthew 23, Jesus had a very severe lessons for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those religious leaders of, of, of his community. But in, verse, in chapter 24, beginning verse 1, it says that Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him and called his attention to his buildings. What buildings were they referring to? They were referring to the city of Jerusalem, a glorious, magnificent city at the time. And then Jesus said to them, do you see this city? Do you see all these things? He says, I tell you, not one stone here will be left, one another, and everyone will be thrown down. This is the most shocking statement in Matthew 24 because the disciples had been with Jesus for the last three and a half years. And they were expecting that his kingdom will replace the entire Roman Empire. And they will be ministers on both his right and left hand. And they will were, they were be great politicians of that great city. And here Jesus said that what? No, this city shall be gone. And they were shocked. And in verse 3, when what Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Bible says the disciples came to him privately. That's the reason for that. Because it was too embarrassing to us. Because they were all expecting that his kingdom will be a kingdom of mighty army. And they will be financially and socially rewarded to those high positions in his newfound kingdom, so to speak. And here Jesus said, no, on the other hand, the city will be gone. And then they say, okay, if that is true, Lord, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming, the end of age? Now, I don't need to go through all the details with you. If you have been a Seventh-day Adventist for a long time, if you turn to Matthew 24, 25, these are the two familiar chapters that we constantly preach on, share on, talk about. And especially in moments like this, wow, people will say, Pastor, I think the end is coming. I say, wow, you have viruses uh, uh, become pandemic. It's a world health issue. Uh, yesterday night at 11.35, uh, I was in many chat groups. Huh? You know, today, that's the problem with too many chat groups. Huh? And at night, if you don't do the silent mode, you get ting, 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 you get alarm, right? Notifications all over the place. Oh, there was a guy that was infected. I think number 14 or 15. I stay out Jurong East Street 13, just right across Jurong 7th Adventist Church. <laughs> oh, there was this alarm. I said, relax. I said, why relax? I said, there will be more cases to come. <laughs> I believe me. There will be more cases to come. I said, yeah, we will take the necessary precaution, but don't be overly anxious. 
Live life as per normal. You know, it's very interesting. So one member said, oh, I'm not going to church. So why? Say it's a it could be a potential source of infection. <laughs> so, so I say, Do you go to work? Yeah. Do you go to the NTUC, the supermarket, to the market? Yeah. Then, then, then I said, where is God in this whole equation? So the disciples were asking, what would the signs be? When you come, tell us, when will be the end of times? The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been preaching that since the beginning of our Adventist movement, isn't it? And are you tired of hearing that? They say, are you sure Jesus is coming again? My father came to the church because of a VOP card that was left on the floor. He picked it up, he signed up as a VOP voice of prophecy, uh, enrolled in the correspondent course, and I came to the church. And so as a young boy, I followed him to church, week after week, month after month, year after year. And the preacher would be shouting at the pulpit, Jesus is coming soon. Look at all the signs. As a teenager, I stopped believing for a while. I said, well, not sure. Right, but that has been spoken for so many years. You know, it's like, is it a cry wolf thing? Like, it's coming, it's coming, but there's a delay. It's coming, it's coming, there's a delay. And uh, one day, while my father was uh, praying that Jesus is coming soon, let us get prepared. I told my father, Can, don't ask Jesus to come so soon. <laughs> oh, he was very shocked, very mad. Uh, as a conservative Seventh-day Adventist, he said, why are you saying this? I said, because if Jesus were to come tomorrow, there are many things I have not enjoyed. I have not eaten, I have not gone, I have not visited. Can he come later after I have gone and see all these places then? He can, he can come. But here the disciples were very concerned that, so what are the signs? And we hear about famines and wars and earthquakes and all kinds of things. But I want to draw your attention to Matthew 24 verse 14 because all these things shall come. And then Jesus said this punchline in Matthew 24. And he said, that what? That, and this, king, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. The, uh, the other translation, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then, the end will come. It's not about the wars. It's not just about the famines or the earthquakes or the tsunamis or the Wuhan virus. According to the scripture from the word of Jesus, when the gospel is preached to the whole world, then the end will come. It is interesting, the word persecution in, in Greek, in the original language, is also translated as distress and tribulation. And this word is translated 45 times in the entire New Testament in various uh, words. But four times occur in the whole gospel of Matthew. And out of the four times in the Gospel of Matthew, three times appear in Matthew 24. So it, it gives you the sense of alarm, the sense of urgency, the sense of distress that will come upon the world just before Jesus returns. And a lot of them uh, sometimes wonder, you know, like, Pastor, what is the Gospel? I'm going to share it today. I'm not going to do an exposition of that. A lot of seven day Adventists are mistaken. It's like, oh, the gospel is about the Sabbath. No, that is not the gospel. It's part of the gospel. But it's not the gospel. The gospel is on the character of who? Who is the main character of the gospel? Who is the good news? Jesus. Jesus is the personification of the gospel. He is the main character of the gospel. And every teaching of the church, we call it doctrine, is a derivative of the gospel. It's a consequence of the gospel. Every teaching must point to Jesus. When we talk about the Sabbath, we talk about stewardship, the state of the dead, the century message, the spirit of prophecy. Every of the teaching of the Christian church, especially with the Seventh-day Adventist movement, must point to one person, Jesus. You know, it's like, if today I come to Maranatha Church, I'm going to bring a lot of gifts because this is the Chinese New Year. Everybody will be getting a $1,000 ang pao. Wow. Wow, he said, wow, that is good. Pastor Johnny is coming. And out of the 130, 140 members in Maranatha, whoever attended, everybody get a $1,000 uh, 
thousand dollars ang pao. Wow! And then you get cartons of oranges and cookies and 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 all the good gifts. Your focus should not be on the ang pao. Your first primary focus should be on who? Whether Johnny Khan is coming or not. If he's coming, we get all the benefits. If he's not coming, there is no ang pao. So the gospel is is in this sense Jesus. And all other teachings derive from him. And so when Jesus says, the gospel will be preached to the whole world. And then the end will come. It is important to recognize this because in, in Matthew 24 and 25, this is the difference. It's just a summary, a framework for us to understand. In Matthew 24, Jesus talked about the signs of his coming. In Matthew 25, it's about the preparation for his coming. In Matthew 24, he talks about the events of the world before he returns. In Matthew 25, he talks about the conditions of the church before he comes. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about what happens out there before he comes. In Matthew 25, he talks about what happens right here in his church before he returns. And so, this is made in the context of that. And so, if you go to to Paul himself, he says it very clear in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2. He says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So the gospel is about Jesus who came, who died and rose again and to bring us back to Himself. And especially from the seventh day Adventist perspective, the three angels' message is not the gospel. It's part of the gospel as we look through the lens of Jesus' return. The three angels' message give us the, the warning, the, the sense of urgency, the sense that God desires us back into His kingdom. Very often, I think, the gospel makes us the equal of every human being, believer or not. Because the gospel helps us to see our need for the Saviour. And that is why Jesus told the disciples that all these rumours that you hear about wars, famines, earthquakes, you name it, they shall come. And go. But until the message is shared around the globe, then the end will come. You know, it's very interesting um, whether we are sharing the gospel or not, whether we are involved in evangelism or not, Jesus will come nevertheless. So some people say, oh, no, no, no. I thought we must, the seven advantage was bring the gospel to the whole world. God uses the seven day Adventist church to bring the gospel to every kindred tongue and people. But it is God that will finish the work. Not you and I. You and I are merely willing to be submitted into His hand, to be instrument used by Him. God will finish the work. You think of the globe, more than seven billion people. How do you and I can, humanly speaking, bring the message to all people? Our world it's right here in Singapore. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is organized in such a way that every region, every country has their own geographical responsibility. And that is the world. Not that we are neglecting the global movement of the Adventist Church, no. But this is the whole world. And God will finish the work. So we cannot hold God ransom. Or if I'm not giving Bible studies, I'm not involved in discipleship making, if I'm not helping evangelism, I'm not, then... God will delay indefinitely of his return. No. <laughs> that would be too arrogant and presumptuous. God is not dependent on us, but he wants to use us and partner with us in this glorious and privileged, we call it evangelism, so to speak, to bring the gospel, the message to everyone, regardless of their language, background, culture, skin color. And that is why there is this, this essence of time. You know, do you realize that one month has come and gone for the whole month of January? And because people are so concerned with the virus, all the notifications, and today someone sent me, Pastor, I teach you where to get masks. I think there's an there's a app called Mask Go Where, is it? Is it? Ma, ma, I, I forgot. Uh, uh, where, where to get a mask? Uh? Because the government says that every household will be given four uh, surgical masks, you know. They were very concerned about that. I said, let us more concerned about how do we help the people right here in Singapore? 
with the impending sense of urgency, especially as a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, they say, as far as time is concerned, if you look at Revelation 14, the three angels' message is the urgent appeal to people to come into the realm of God. It is to invite people to come. You know, the time. They say, do you realize the value of 10 years? As a newly divorced couple, 10 years is a painful time, long time. Say, do, do you realize the value of one year? As a student who has failed the final exam. Do you realize the value of one month? Ask a mother who has given birth to a premature baby. Do you realize the value of one week? To ask the editor of a big newspaper. Do you realize the value of one hour? Ask the lovers who are waiting to meet. Do you realize the value of one minute? Ask the person who has missed the train, bus or plane, especially if you are catching a flight back to Singapore from China. Do you realize the value of one second? Ask the person who has survived an accident. Do you realize the value of one millisecond? Ask the person who has won a silver medal in the Olympics. Time waits for no one. And I think we recognize that the clock is ticking. And, and how can we help people to understand, to embrace, to experience the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that the Seventh-day Adventist Church fulfills its obligation, its spiritual mission that has been entrusted, that was raised in these days and time for this purpose. It was said that back in the times of telegraph, telegraph is basically the, uh, the machine that uh, helps to, for long-distance communication. And the method is known as the Morse code. Uh, you know, the Morse code is basically to encode text character in dots and dashes. And so, back in the early days, you know, there was no answering machine, there was no fax, there was no uh, telephone, was expensive. Uh, telegraph machines and the Morse code system is the method of communication. And there was a newspaper advertisement that, that uh, asked people to come in, they, they apply as a Morse code operator. And so, uh, many people responded to that, and so that morning, uh, this gentleman applied to the ad and he went to the office. He entered a large, busy office that was filled with noise and clutter, and uh, including the sound of the telegraph in the background. You can hear the ta 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 all this background clutter noise. And a sign on the receptionist counter instructed the job applicants to fill up the form and wait until they're summoned to enter the inner office. And there was this young man who came, filled up his form, he sat down with seven other applicants in the waiting area. Interestingly, after a few minutes, this young man stood up, crossed the room to the door of the inner office, walked right in. And naturally, the other applicants were very disturbed. What was going on? And they talked to themselves. They had not yet heard, they, had, uh, they have not been summoned yet to, for the interview. So they assumed the young man went to the office, made a mistake, and he would be disqualified immediately. Within a few minutes, however, the employer escorted that young man out of the office and said to all other applicants, Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming and applying for the interview. The job has been filled. And immediately, the other, six, uh, the other applicants that were there, they, they, they stood up in protest. Says, wait a minute. Say, we don't understand. He was the last to come in and uh, we never even have a chance to be interviewed. Yet, he got the job. That's not fair. What did the employer say? I'm sorry. Say, but all the time while you were sitting here, the telegraph has been ticking out with the following message in Morse code. And it reads, if you understand this message, then come right in. The job is yours. <laughs> None of you heard or understood it, but this young man did, and this is his job. In the midst of all the cluttered information in the world, a lot of people get drowned today. How can you and I be that spiritual Morse code interpreter to help others to understand the message of Matthew 24, of Revelation 14, and the impending prophecies that God has revealed to mankind? How can we be the spiritual Morse code operator to interpret 
that message for those who have yet ex- not yet experienced the full saving grace of Jesus Christ. How can we do that? You know, I think we all have a part to play. As a Seventh-day Adventist church, I think we started off with sending missionaries all over the world. And Singapore is a result of those missionaries that were sent, including countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, you name it, every corner of the world. And the, the, the emphasis is that we must reach the different cities, the different continents, the different people groups, so that what? So that we play a part in that whole dissemination of the gospel message. We are not just interested in just telling people. We want to help them to grow, mature, as faithful disciples of the kingdom of God so that their transformed life will lead to a multiplied life. And that is the whole purpose of the discipleship vision. And, and I think, if you look back in time, what has changed? You know, I, when I show this photograph, uh, the, the you see the uh, lady's hairstyle? I, I was flipping through, uh, for those of you in your 50s and 60s uh, or 70s, don't need to raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> now, you thought for the young ladies that uh, you think only you are contemporary in your hair styling uh, perception. Your mothers, your grandmothers also have their styling moments, isn't it? Uh, I was told that when my mother had one of those hairstyles that went uh, like a pyramid that was super high, she came back, I refused to recognize her as my mom <laughs> because the hair style has changed. But even though the hair styling has changed, we are still interested in hair styling today. Those of you who grew up in Singapore in the 1950s and 60s, remember the bus? The Hockley bus. bus, right. Remember the television? I used to stay in Tangling Hall, Block 52. It's a common, uh, it's a one-room flat. No money, little money we had. And our neighbour bought a new first 14-inch black and white TV. It was the talk of the town. And as a child, they were very gracious to us. And we would go there and watch our cartoons. You know, it started at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, you have the national anthem and then uh, you have the four languages of greeting. And then well, it's only for 12 hours. You know? And if you can watch a TV for half an hour for cartoons, wow, that was the best treat of the day. And we refused to go because we don't have a TV. Things have changed, isn't it? Uh, remember the provision shop? Uh, the Garanguni man? It's a kacang putih. I don't know it's salah. Do you know when the handphone came on stage? None of the pastors had ever had a handphone. And there was a generous member, I think it's from Maranatha Church, they donated a second hand handphone to the Singapore mission bed at that time. And I remember Pastor Matthew Yuan had the handphone. He was the mission president at that time. And it was the big handphone, you know. It was a status symbol. You know, when you have your meal, you put it right on the table. <laughs> wow. You had, a, you had the D communi- telecommunication equipment of the time. And I remember looking at it with envious. So, while John Tan and I were organizing a youth camp, uh, for the mission at that time. And I said, Pastor Yuan, our camp will be quite far away. I think it's in the, the uh, Lim Chu Kang area. He said, can I loan your mobile phone? He said, why? I said, just for emergency purpose. <laughs> and I remember during those days, uh, I don't know if you were there in the, in the youth camp, uh, John and I would take turns to carry around with the mobile phone. <laughs> Isn't the things have changed? But the message remains the same. The message remains the same. And, 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 and that is why we are still instructed to share the gospel to every kindred, tongue and people. You know, the Bible says in the fullness of time, the Messiah will appear. In the first century, do you know why? Because you go back to history, the Romans had built highways throughout the entire empire. 
That's why we have English saying, right? Every road leads to Rome. And today, if you go to some parts of Europe, you could still see the architecture of the Roman um, engineers that had built and constructed those highways throughout the whole of Europe and Asia Minor. And so the gospel could be, could be easily reached in all the cities. That's why Apostle Paul has different missionary journeys that enable him to build churches, to raise up churches, to counsel churches, and the disciples scattered in all places and directions because it was the fullness of time. If you fast forward that 2,000 years later, today we live in a world in the fullness of time. When Ellen White was given the vision that the printed materials, books, publications of the church would be like the, the ray of light that would engulf the globe. Wow. We, 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 we print literature, books, magazines for hundreds of years. HMS Richard, when he started using radio, people laugh at him. Why would you bother to do that? He says, no, radio is the communication. And that led to voice of prophecy later on. Um, uh, it was... Uh, it is written as part of the heritage of that continuation. The Adventist World Radio, for many years during the communist era in China, in Russia, through that broadcast, through shortwave, brought the gospel and the soon coming of Jesus to many people. When the doors were opened, when finally these communist countries were, were, were changed politically, many came to the church. When Pastor Mark Finney went to Russia to preach during the first evangelistic meetings. Do you know many of them say, we have hurt you because of the radio communications. So, the, the Adventist church is not new to all this, this thing. Today, we live in a time, in the fullness of time, where the internet, the global information highway can be reached in all places. Agree? Almost every place you can find Internet connection. You know, you remember the days when those of you had pager? It was very inconvenient, right? right? And Samsung had the time trying to change the mind. They're trying to sell um, pages you know, to, to people. And I remember this advertisement. There are two advertisements, one on Time magazine and one on, uh, on, 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 the, on the television. And the Samsung advertisement was that this monk went into the high mountains of meditation, quiet, absolute, in isolation. Then he beja bus. In the midst of his meditation, he had to look at the number. Okay, peace again. It shows you that the infiltration of the technology, you can't escape. And there was this Time magazine advertisement of one of the tribes in Africa hunting for lions. And halfway through, it was, a, it was a hunter that was on his phone with his friend on the other side. Look out for the lion. <laughs> Those advertisements were 20 over years ago. Today, we live in this global information highway and we have the privilege to evangelize to the world. And based on Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus says, if I were to paraphrase in today's language, what he's saying is this. Come and participate with me to bring the gospel, the good news about me to all people via, via different ways and means so that I can come back quickly and bring you home. And that is the essence of the, of the rising of this whole Adventist movement in these days. And God will use whoever is willing for the furtherance of his work. If you are not willing, if I'm unwilling, God will say, no issue. I will use others. I will raise up others. And, but it is a privilege. Alan White says that God could have used his angels to evangelize to the world. But he chose to use broken human beings like you and I so that we can experience the privilege and the honour of serving together with him to bring the good news to everyone. I want to share with you why we have the Hope Channel Network in Singapore. We are actually behind time. 
behind the curve. For many years, we have our radio station. And uh, last year, during the Discipleship Congress, we began the launch of our Hope Channel Singapore. I just want to show you the tip, uh, just a video, two minutes, on the launch of the Hope Channel Singapore. Maybe we have the order. The 55 Hope Channel Network uh, establishment in this whole channel movement. The Hope Channel established as part of the information highway to bring the gospel, as what we have said in Matthew 24, 14. That focus, that laser focus to bring the gospel to every kindred tongue and people across the globe. And we established that in spite of the huge cost and, and the change of our paradigm of ministry, we want to do that so that we can be part of this whole great movement of God's work. You know, I am glad that we have our Hope Channel uh, um, team here. I just want to introduce to you, uh, we have Faith outside, right, right at the back. Outside there, we have Joash uh, being our newest member uh, that included in our team. And then I want to invite Anandan, our General Manager for the Hope Channel Singapore, uh, to just explain to us briefly uh, where we were and where we are today because we have been using our radio broadcast. Many of you are aware of the radio station. Uh, used to be 105 FM, now it's 107 FM. And then maybe share with us. Good morning, friends. It's nice to come up here in front of you. All the time that you have seen me here uh, has been always for the radio in the past, yeah? and I've given you the rundown on what the radio has done. Now, one of the most difficult things in radio transmission has been to track who's actually listening, how many people actually gain from this. So we use, you know, statistics, you know, imaginary statistics. For every person that calls into the radio, you would have about 500 others that won't call, but would listen. So in the US, that's what they do. So they, they base it on about 500 people. Mm -hmm. Now in Singapore, we have been very conservative. We said for every person that calls in, 100 others are listening, you know? And so, yeah, we've, we've got some statistics in that sense. But with uh, Hope Channel, um, we have been able to get a lot more in terms of info because this is internet-based. And so we have subscribed to uh, different providers that enable for us to go in to research and to find out. So 817 followers on Facebook to date. In the last 28 days, there were 11,665 people that were reached. And the number of people, this is of course the number of people who actually went in and saw any of our pages, yeah? 2,325 post engagements 
Now, this means anybody that says they like or they give you a comment, yeah? Now, these are good numbers. I've never been able to tell you this, you know, with the radio. Now, let's, let's go on here. Now, new users are 1,311, yeah? And they have gone in into our site, and uh, we have 4,995 page views. That means these people actually went in and stayed there for something like, what, seven minutes, yeah, per session? And the bounce rate, that means they go in there, they have a look, and then whoosh, they go off somewhere else, yeah? It's about 34%. Now, the other people stayed. You know, this is pretty good. And what I'm trying to impress you with is, there is an opportunity here for each one of us to take this and move it even further. You know, because God's given us this, what, this call to go out there and do something, right? To go out there and tell the world about Him. Now, I may not be proficient in, you know, or, or, or good in the way that I express myself, but hey, there's lots of stuff here that you can just say, hey, fellas, would you watch this? Would you listen to this? Now, we are going to make some progress here. There are going to be new local video programs. I will be in this corner here afterwards. Come check it out, yeah? What we're going to be doing in terms of the video aspect. Now, some of you, last week when I was here, spoke to me about, hey, how about those programs on radio that I used to hear? What happened to It Is Written? What happened to the Voice of Prophecy? What happened to the Sabbath School lessons? You know, because those things I used to enjoy. And you know what? I don't have to sit in one place and keep my eyes focused on something that I'm listening to. I could just plug in my headset and just walk around and still do my things and listen. So we are coming in, of course, on this platform because if you went to our website, you will see that we have a listen aspect. Now, we are expanding that, so we will have the weekly Sabbath school, it is written, the voice of prophecy, and the other audio programs that you used to hear on a regular radio, now you will hear it on our Hope Channel site, yeah? So, now, this is on demand, meaning at your own time, yeah, at your own target. You decide what you want to listen, when you want to listen to it, not according to the time that I schedule it, yeah? Uh, so. Come and see how you can help, okay? I'll be in this corner. I'm going to set up the little computer and hopefully use that TV there. Uh, and let's talk a little bit more. There are many ways in which we can move this. But, you know, if God doesn't move in your heart and bring about that, you know, intention, yeah, you have to have that intention when, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar threw these three people into the fire, they were clear. They had an intention. They determined in their heart. So what do we determine this morning? Yeah. So here, you can watch, you can follow, you can share. Hope Channel Singapore. And you can be an online missionary. Yeah. Man, you know, there's ample opportunity for you to get there and do this. All you have to do is go to uh, the uh, App Store or Google Play Store and download our app, yeah? So, we have a lot of possibilities. We have our churches in all the different places. Singapore is covered, but if each one of us would just take on and go with what we have, man, we're going to build a whole new relationship with people in Singapore. Yeah? So, Pastor, That's it. I will hand it back to you. <laughs> thank you. You know, I just want to go back. Uh, thank you, Anand. Yeah. I think uh, our team, uh, Faith, Joash, and Anand, will be glad to explain to you a little bit more. Uh, just, just, just let me make it clear so that you understand. We are moving from just a mere radio station broadcast into the Hope Channel Information Highway. That allow us to have more avenues, more opportunities, and different ways and means to reach out to more people. But we are not just interested in that. 
Because at the end of the day, it's not just broadcasting. It is also to bring people into the church. A few weeks ago, one of the pastors says that one of the uh, visitors that came to the church, because after watching the Hope Channel Singapore programs, says, okay, uh, visit the nearest Adventist church. He Google. He found one of the churches he went in. He says, oh, I, 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 I came to this church because of your program and invitation. And it is our intention, very intentional, that over time, many of our programs, at the end of every program, we want to invite them. And says that find the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church in the vicinity. So if somebody stay in the east, they Google, Maranatha church is the nearest. And if they come in, I don't want members to say, that, oh, I don't know, what Hope Channel Singapore, what is that? <laughs> huh? Is that the place to buy masks for the <laughs> virus? Or what, what, what is that? All right. And, and I think, you know a lot of people post all kinds of things on their social media. Today you post a lot of things on your Instagram, on your Facebook, and what you have. But you can share many of these local productions or stories. Pastor Johnny Wong is also part of the Hope Channel of, uh, a team. Uh, he is featured in one of these uh, uh, daily devotion. Uh, we want to expand more. There will be more coming local programs, production, but we want to invite members to participate to help. Some of you may have talents in perhaps uh, in scale of video filming. Maybe you are good in script writing. Maybe you have certain, uh, you say, I just want to volunteer and send um, books to the listeners who are interested or those viewers who are interested to know more about the Sabbath. We have lots of books about Sabbath to send to them. We want to activate the entire church on different platform levels. Give us time, give us patience. Uh, we, we will try to work through that mechanism. But at the end of the day, Hope Channel must work with the local church in order to finish the work. And Hope Channel does not stand alone. Hope Channel Singapore, part of the global network of Hope Channels, must work with the local church. And that's why we are here today. And the team is here to explain more. So, we want to urge you, as simple as sharing all kinds of ways to get face masks on your social media about the 15 or 16 or the potential 20th person in Singapore infected with virus, why don't you share some message of hope and encouragement and help them to focus on not what is seen but what is unseen, 2 Corinthians 4, because what is unseen is eternal. So that is the primary purpose of this establishment. We spend a lot of resources doing that and we need your prayer, we need your support in every possible way. And so, at the end of the day, the Hope Channel Singapore mission statement is what? Not just the sharing of the message, but at the end of the day, we want to engage them onto a face-to-face -face relationship in the local church. Because someone who remains online forever will be hard to integrate into the fellowship of the church, isn't it? And community. So we want to convert somebody online to offline. And that is the purpose. The Hope Channel Singapore itself is not the end by itself. It's just a tool. One of the tools within the Seventh-day Adventist Church movement that God has used and raised in these days. And so we ask for your prayer. We ask for your support. Last but not least, I want to close with this. Paul, you know, talks about his encouragement to the churches. He wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 5. And he says to them, especially to the Christians, who are very busy with their lives, uh, uh, struggle with everyday living, taking care of the kids, with the finances, investment. Uh, you think secularism only happens in the 21st century? You are deadly wrong. Visit some of the Roman cities. Let those uh, curators tell you the, the, the type of secularism that happens in the first century is as great, if not intense, than today. Different forms and means too. And and. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, I want to end with this. And this is a paraphrase from the message. Okay? It's just to highlight the, the way I want to convey, but I thought the message is a paraphrase, but I thought it brings up the essence of in today's language. Let me read to you as we end. Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 11 to 17, don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work, the barren pursuits of darkness. Today people are a lot, always very busy. Busy with what? With the phone. Busy with the phone, serving all kinds of information and scouting and waiting for notification and posting on Instagram and I don't know what. Do you know I met a group of uh, professionals? Uh, maybe some of you may be aware. They, they practice the digital fast. Heard of it? In other words, they are non-believers. 
but they thought that they had been overly saturated today with digital medias, with all the gadgets. So once a week, it's like a Sabbath. 24 hour. I was shocked, I heard about it. <laughs> 24 hour in a, in a week. They actually practice digital fast. In other words, this is a group gathering, I imagine. Huh? They come together, they say, okay, we'll meet on a Sunday. And then in the morning at 6 a.m., they will switch off their phone, on computer, nothing. They will come and meet, maybe have a gathering. No exposure to the digital device. For what reason? They said they have been overly saturated. And sometimes the digital devices are the masters rather than the servants. And then they do that. And I was surprised. Wow. Why? So they can focus on things that are important. They told me, one of the gentlemen said, I was shocked. So I said, okay, one day I must go and visit this digital fast. They said, but if you come, you must also practice digital fasting. I said, okay, let me think about it. Huh? <laughs> I said, but it's interesting, so I will go. The next time when I come, come back to preach, I, I want to share with you what, what will be my experience. But Paul says here, don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work and barren pursuit of darkness. Expose things for the shame they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the cover off this frost and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. And then it continues. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Very strong words, huh? Say what? Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use your head. I think a lot of parents tell their children, right? Use your head, right? Uh, <laughs> you score people uh, using the phrase. Uh, but here in the paraphrase, it says, use your head. What? Why? In light of what? Eternity. Make the most of every chance you get. This is what? I think we all can agree. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants, what God wants. So what does God want you to do today? May His Spirit speak to you, impress upon you, encourage you, <laughs> affirm you, uplift you, so that you can be a part of this whole event, this global movement that you and I have been called to bring the everlasting gospel to every light, to every kindred, every people, to your neighbours, to your friends, to your colleagues, to the residents right here within a two, three kilometre radius of Maranatha Church. And I pray the church would not remain status quo, but in this celebration of the New Year Festival with all this possible endemic they may come upon the island, we focus on eyes on Jesus Christ that who will help us to finish the race. May the Lord bless us.